Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. There are three principal types of fatty acid oxidation. The first, the most common kind, is beta oxidation. That's what generally every biochemistry course talks about. There's also omega oxidation, which was discussed in the previous video, and then here we'll discuss alpha oxidation. And to discuss alpha oxidation, I'm going to start off with this very large molecule called chlorophyll. This is specifically chlorophyll A. You'd probably talk about it in a Biochem 2 course. And it's the pigment that we find in plants and other photosynthetic organisms. Generally, it gives those organisms a green color. You might be asking, why in the world would I show you a chlorophyll molecule if we're going to be talking about oxidation? of fatty acids. Well, it's because this chlorophyll molecule has this interesting side chain over here. So this side chain down here where I'm pointing resembles a fatty acid, but it has several important differences. Um, the most notable, of course, being these branches that stick off of it. So this side chain, what we'll see is it will eventually become a fatty acid, but it's a branched chain fatty acid. Okay? And that will pose a problem for normal beta oxidation, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But the reason I show you this chlorophyll molecule is because herbivorous and omnivorous mammals can actually obtain chlorophyll in the diet. Now, this process does happen in humans, although it's not very important in humans. It's more important in ruminant mammals. So ruminant mammals are those organisms that they consume things like grass, things that are clearly green, and they can derive energy and derive nutrients from those uh, plant-based products by fermentation prior to digestion. Okay? And so this process is a lot more important in ruminant mammals. They can derive a lot of energy through this pathway. Um, it does happen in humans, but it's not near as important. And so ultimately what we have to do is we have to get rid of this side chain right here. This is actually going to be what's called a phytol side chain. And this is accomplished in both humans and ruminant mammals through the enzyme chlorophyllase. Now, we as eukaryotic organisms do not express this enzyme. This is actually a bacterial enzyme. Um, and this is going to be inside the large intestine or the colon. So they're going to take up this chlorophyll and they're going to break off this phytol side chain. Uh, in humans, the rest of this macrocyclic structure just gets excreted. We don't really care about that. But the phytol can actually be absorbed. And this process I'm about to show you, this is not alpha oxidation, but it is necessary in order to get to alpha oxidation. And this process is thought to occur entirely within the peroxisome. So now that we've removed this phytol side chain, we have to ultimately attach a coenzyme A to it because that's how all uh, fatty acid oxidation works generally. So phytol is oxidized to phytinal by an alcohol dehydrogenase. Notice the alcohol becomes an aldehyde. Then we have an FALDH. This is basically a long chain uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is going to oxidize this aldehyde into a carboxylic acid. This is this phytinic acid. And then phytinic acid can be ligated to this coenzyme A through acyl-CoA synthetase. We saw this enzyme actually at the start of beta oxidation prior to the pathway. And then this double bond right here will get reduced. That's done through an enoyl-CoA reductase. And that gets us to this molecule right here, which is called phytanoyl-CoA. Now this molecule will enter alpha oxidation, although we're still going to be localized in the peroxisome. Now if we go to the next slide, let's take a look at this phytanoyl-CoA real quick. Uh, what we can see here is that there's going to be a significant problem for beta oxidation. And of course, beta oxidation does not occur here. But there's going to be a problem because if we look at the alpha and beta carbon, okay, this carbon right here where my mouse is, the one adjacent to this CO, this is the alpha carbon. And then this one right here with this branch sticking off, that would be the beta carbon. If you go back and look at beta oxidation and you look at the overall mechanism, what you would see is that we would end up with a hydroxyl group off of this carbon, the beta carbon, because it's beta oxidation. And technically, or theoretically, you could put a hydroxyl group right here. But the next step in beta oxidation is oxidizing that hydroxyl group into a carbonyl, a double bond carbon oxygen. Now, if you think of a double bond between this carbon and an oxygen atom, how many bonds would this carbon have? It would have one, two, three, and then four, five. 
That's impossible. So this branch right here is hindering beta oxidation. And so it will not occur on this molecule. So we have to do something to this molecule in order to metabolize it. And what we're essentially going to do is we're going to, we're going to remove one carbon and we're going to shift the alpha carbon to being the beta carbon. Let me show you how that works. The first enzyme here is what's called phytanoyl-CoA hydroxylase. So what that's going to do is it's going to put a hydroxyl group right here on the alpha carbon. Okay, we see that OH right here. Um, this gets us a molecule called 2 hydroxy phytanoyl coa um, We'll come back and talk about this disease briefly in a minute. The next reaction is catalyzed by 2 hydroxy phytanoyl coa lyase. What this enzyme is going to do is it's going to essentially split this bond right here, the bond between the alpha carbon and this thioester carbon right here. Okay? And in the process, it's going to perform an oxidation of the alpha carbon. That's why this pathway is called alpha oxidation. So this hydroxyl group will become a carbonyl, essentially an aldehyde right here, and then this entire group right here is lost. And this group that comes off is simply formyl coa which can then enter a metabolic pathway where it's catabolized to carbon dioxide. Okay? So we can get rid of this. But by oxidizing this alpha carbon into an aldehyde, we now have pristinal. Now, pristinal can then be oxidized into pristanoic acid. So this is an aldehyde right here. We can simply oxidize that into a carboxylic acid. And we have this molecule right here, which is pristanoic acid. Now, let's take a look at the alpha and beta carbon in this case. Well, the alpha carbon is the first carbon that's adjacent to the carboxyl group. That's how we define it. So the alpha carbon now has the branch, and the beta carbon, which is adjacent to that, is now open. That's very good, because now we can perform beta oxidation on this molecule, because we can certainly attach an OH group to this carbon, the beta carbon, and then we can also oxidize it into a carbonyl, because we wouldn't be violating carbon's octet rule, basically. It wouldn't have more than four bonds. Now, of course, we would have to first ligate this pristanoic acid to a coenzyme A, but you already know how that happens. That happens via the same reaction we saw here, which was an acyl-CoA synthetase. Okay? But this essentially can continue through beta oxidation because we freed up that beta carbon and it no longer has a branch as it did up here. So once I have this pristanoic acid, and of course it'll have the coenzyme A on it, we're just going to perform six rounds of beta oxidation on it. We don't have to do this process anymore because if we think about it, the beta carbon is just going to shift two carbons over every time. Here first, the second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, and sixth one. So every time I perform beta oxidation, the beta carbon is never blocked by one of those methyl group branches. Okay? So I don't need to do these reactions anymore. All I need to do is six rounds of beta oxidation, and I'm going to get my products that I can then metabolize. And so this process would allow ruminant mammals to obtain a lot of energy through eating things like grass, which of course contain chlorophyll or leaves, and then they can take off that phytol side chain, metabolize it into phytanoyl coa, and then they can perform alpha oxidation, and then a bunch of beta oxidation to derive energy. Okay. This process happens only marginally in humans because we don't usually eat things like that, okay. but we do get a little bit of chlorophyll. And so if a human gets chlorophyll, they're of course going to produce phytol through colonic bacteria, then this process is going to occur in the peroxisome, but if that person has a defect in this enzyme, phytanoyl-CoA hydroxylase, they have a disease called Refsum's disease. And so in this disease, which we won't go into the symptoms or whatever here, but if you can't actually express this enzyme or it's defective in some way, then the levels of phytanoyl-CoA go up and they start to accumulate. And so you can't actually get rid of this and it poses some metabolic issues. You also can't take this phytanoyl-CoA and convert it down into pristanoic acid and then run beta oxidation on it. So if you have a defect in this enzyme by whatever mechanism, then levels of phytanoyl-CoA build up. Okay, so hopefully alpha oxidation makes some sense. Um, again, remember that it really requires something with a prior phytol side chain, um, and the most obvious example is going to be one of the chlorophyll molecules.
okay? But it's most important in ruminant mammals, not as much in humans, but if we do have a deficiency of that enzyme, we can accumulate some nasty uh, intermediates. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.